post tropical cyclone, I guess, was actually what the uh, yeah. amazing name fall. It was like, whatever, it's a hurricane. Um, give us our hurricane, right? Um, Rachel and I obviously made it back safely, and uh, we went to a wedding yesterday. The, the miracle was that the church never lost power. So the wedding ceremony went off without a hitch. Well, with a hitch, whatever. whatever. Um, I already want to say that, but no problems. And uh, the reception was held in the dark, however. So that was interesting, but it was it was still a good time. Um, definitely a memorable wedding for the young couple. Announcements this morning. Um, let's see. If you are joining us online, we're glad to have you. Leave a comment down below, and uh, we're glad to see those. Sunday school at 9.45 on Sundays, don't forget, we have classes for all ages. Um, the offering plates are in the back. There is a mile of pennies jar back there. There is a missions offering plate back there so that you can give, or you can send them into P.O. Box 2, Jonesport, and we'll get it that way. Uh, young adults, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock over at Main Street. Um, youth group, I believe we're not going to have youth group this week. So stay tuned. The other big thing, <laughs> we're going to start kids club tonight. We're going to have just kids club tonight. Adults, we're not going to have anything for you because somehow we got water in the basement. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, and I don't think it's going to be dry till by uh, evening time. So adults, you guys can call if you want and just kind of observe or whatever. But um, otherwise, we're going to have just kids club tonight. We'll have some fun with the kids. We'll be upstairs at Main Street. <coughs> we're going to be starting at 5.30, going 5.30 to 7. There will be songs and games and uh, lesson and all kinds of fun stuff. All right, so we're going to do that tonight, and we'll start The Chosen next week, and uh, after we get everything dried out. Um, trying to think, is there anything else? Um, I know that Doris says she put an address for Mary Wallace on the back table. If anybody is interested in sending a card, Mary started her treatments Thursday, you said, Doris? I think. Was it Thursday she started her treatments? I believe she had the first on Thursday. Okay. So, um, so yeah, if anybody wants to send a card, there's an address back there. Um, I think that's it. We're going to learn maybe a new song for some this morning. And... Uh, be patient with us because it might be a new song for William too, um, and me. But we're gonna try this. Build your life. Build, build my life. Build my life. Uh, it's on your chorus sheet. We're gonna sing it through a couple times, so hopefully we get the hang of it. But um, you know, God is so good to us. He's watched over us in the storm. We have a beautiful, absolutely gorgeous day today, and you know, He's constantly building our lives. Um, part of that, part of that is his word, you know, his word, his laws, his commands, his precepts, they are constantly shaping us. And our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 19. It says the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the law are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. As we come to worship this morning, take your chorus sheet, stand with me. We're going to try this. Build my life. Every breath we could ever breathe, 
We are so glad that you are our God, our Savior, our King, and our friend. We are safe in your arms. We are able to come into your presence and to learn and to grow. Father, your, your statutes, your precepts, your commands, they give light and life to us. And Father, we want to learn from you this morning. We come with our hearts and our minds open. We come with our, our thanksgiving and our praise. We come just ready to rest in your arms. Father, thank you so much for all that you've done. The way you've protected us and guided us through the storm, literally. And Father, through the way that you are guiding us through maybe some of our storms in our lives. We just come to you again asking you to pour your spirit upon us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Take your hymnals, number 134. One thirty-four. One of my favorite hymns. I probably said that every time we said, sang it. <clears throat> Excuse me. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine.
love that song is the progression that the songwriter had in that. There's a growth, isn't there? As we go through and we learn to love God and then we learn to love Him more and we learn to love Him more in all of life's situations. You know, through life, through salvation, through growing, through death, and then eventually into our eternal reward. We're going to learn all these different ways to love Him the longer we serve Him. You know, it kind of reminds me of that Gaither song, the, the, the uh, longer, I think it's the Gaither, the longer I serve Him, the, yeah, something like that. Anyways, we always learn from Him, don't we? As we go to prayer this morning... Um, I heard that Stevie Crowley passed away this week. That's right. And so remember the Crowley family there. Um, also remember Oscar Crowley's family. They're going to have service this afternoon at 2 at the Congregational Church and a memorial service for Oscar's mm -hmm. life. So remember them this afternoon, especially. Um, we can praise that everyone made it through the hurricane safely, but I know there's going to be cleanup and there's going to be things, so we'll, we'll pray for the aftermath and whatever little bit of the storm is still traveling on. Um, be praying for that. Uh, continue to remember Mary as she goes through her treatments. Continue to remember Shelly. Um, Sue. What's that? Sue. Sue. Yep. Yeah. What else this morning? Twyla. Twyla? She fell and broke two ribs. Oh dear. She's not doing good. Okay. All right. So pray for Twyla. What else? Star's going to get her result this week. Say it again. Okay, so remember Star. Remember our kids club tonight. Kelsey. Kelsey, yes. Anything else? Unspoken. Unspoken? Anybody else have an unspoken? Okay. Our prayer chorus says, Hallelujah, praise the Lamb. And we have much to praise Him for, and we have hopefully much we're going to praise Him for. That's how I see it. When we, when we offer up our prayer request, we should be praising already for the answers that are coming. So hallelujah, praise the Lamb. praise you for watching over us in the storm that came through. We pray for any that are still experiencing the effects of that, that you would keep them safe. We pray for the cleanup that will happen, that you keep people safe there as they um, run saws and equipment. We pray for our uh, linesmen and as they go out and fix things. Uh, Father, we just pray that everything would get back into order. But we thank you. Thank you that we're here. We have a beautiful day. We, 
We thank you for watching over the travels that took place. Father, we thank you for the weddings that happened this weekend. Father, we just pray you bless those couples. Continue to guide them in the days ahead. We pray, Father, that you would continue to watch over us. We know that today there are unspoken requests. We pray that you would lift them up, encourage them, give them strength and wisdom for everything they need. We know that there are those that need a physical touch of healing. Um, Father, we pray that you be with Star. She waits for these results this week. Pray for Mary as she goes through her, her um, treatments. And pray you keep her strong and that these would be effective. We uh, pray for Shelly this morning as I know there are still things that need to be decided and, and figured out. And we pray that you would just guide them every step of the way. Pray for Kelsey as she's going through this hard time and pray that you would touch her and guide the doctors and nurses as they try to figure things out. Father, we ask that you would um, be with Twyla today and heal her and let her gain strength and, and balance even, Father, that she not have more falls. <clears throat> Father, pray for Sue this morning. Continue to pray for her health. We think of others that have been on our list back and forth, and we just pray that you would watch over our community as a whole, be with the different people and the many different problems that are out there. We pray for our families that have lost loved ones that are feeling that grief. We think of Stevie's family this morning and, and this new uh, comfort that they need from you, Father. Pray for Oscar's family as they come together and remember his life and pray that it be a time of comfort for them, that you would be present. We pray for others as well, Father, as a loss remains and we just pray that you would put your arms around them today. We pray for our state, our country, our world. We think of the leaders that have been elected and we pray that you be with our president and other officials that we have elected to do their job. We pray that they would come and seek your guidance, that they would have good things in mind, Father, that would please you. We pray for our military men and women that you would, wherever they are serving, that you would protect and guide them, give them strength for the job they have. Father, I think of our missionaries and I think of the church around the world and ask that you would continue to watch over it. Father, there are so many places where Christians face life and death situations every day. And Father, we know that you are there and you are working because we see people's lives transformed even in the midst of those hardships. And we know that that only happens because you are a great God and there is a truth there that they need for their lives. But Father, let your church stand boldly, no matter what comes against it, because you have said that it is a rock that we are built upon. And the gates of hell cannot overcome us. And so Father, whatever we do, we pray that you go with us, go ahead of us, Guide us where we need to be. Be with our kids club as we start tonight. And, and help us to have a great time there. <coughs> Excuse me. Be with our opening of your word right now as we learn and look at it. And try to hear what you have to say to us. Father, give us your peace, your presence, your joy, your very self. In your name we pray. Junior church? Okay. I didn't see anyone moving right away, so I just wanted to. Oh, that's fine. I'm slow this morning, too. So. It was one of those mornings I left, went out the door and I was like, I feel like I'm forgetting something. So far, I haven't forgotten anything that I know of, but you just have that feeling, you know? Reflect for a minute. 
What do you count as the greatest accomplishment in your life? Some may have more to review than others. But you know what? I've had a few days to think on that question as I prepared this sermon, and I'm still having a hard time. What is, what would I call my greatest accomplishment? It's a hard question, isn't it? I've done many things. I don't know what I would put in the top slot. I think for many people, their greatest accomplishment is not completely recognized until after they're gone. Kind of a sad thing, isn't it? How many authors and artists were poor and destitute their entire life and only received recognition and fame and wealth after death? Feels like it's kind of a waste, doesn't it, in some ways? And yet we have their music, their artwork, their literary genius for years and centuries to come, right? And maybe for each of us, that is our accomplishment. It's how we make the world a better place, right? Maybe that's our greatest accomplishment, how we made the world better. How many stories have you heard of people that leave a legacy of service or money or encouragement or family or something that just makes the world a better place? Paul understood the greatest legacy he could leave on this earth were the lives transformed by Jesus Christ. And so he put his entire energy into that goal, to win people to Christ, to teach people about Christ, to help them mature in Christ. That was his whole life, to win as many for the gospel as possible. John Wesley put it this way, do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, for as long as you can. Did you get all that? Basically, put your whole life into the work of God, right? Put, throw your whole self into doing what God wants and seeing lives change. It's discipleship. It's evangelism. It's fellowship. It's growing. It's all of that. Believers teaching believers. Christians creating more Christians. Churches reproducing churches. That is the work, the legacy that we pass on. We have to. God's called us to that. And if the church were to stop any of those things, the church would not exist. And so we need to continue on. Those are the most important things. Today in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to take a look at this holy legacy. And about how we make it our greatest work. How we can make it our greatest work. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verses 12, verse 12, where we're going to pick up 12 to 18. And you remember he started this chapter with this whole follow the imitation of Christ, right? Follow Christ's example. So because we're following Christ's example, in verse 12 he says, Therefore, my dear friends... As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to set and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among the stars in the sky, like the stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Remember, Philippians is that letter of joy. And here again, we see Paul saying, I rejoice. Come rejoice with me. Rejoice over what?
There is a joy in sacrifice and service. You know, there's a lot of people that never understand that. They think sacrifice is just painful. A sacrifice is just something you have to do and get it over with. Right? But there's a joy there. There's a joy in service. Boy, there's some people that don't like to serve, right? Some people that just do not like to serve anybody else. But you know, there's, there's, there's a joy that comes from serving others. A joy in helping somebody. Have you ever had a task you approached with, I'll do it, but I won't like it? Ever? Come on. Seems like I did it a lot more as a kid, but then I realized as an adult, there's probably more tasks that fit that category. I'll do my taxes, but I won't like it. Come on. I'll go for that medical checkup, but I won't like it. I'll go and check on insurance, but I won't like it. The list goes on and on, doesn't it? There are things in life as adults that we have to do. There are things in life as people we have to do. But I won't like it. Paul tells us here to do everything. Now that, that seems like a pretty broad category there, doesn't it? Everything without grumbling or complaining. Anybody feel convicted there? Because I do. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. It hits a little close to home, doesn't it? This was Paul's habit. This was his choice that he was making from the very beginning of the book of Philippians. To rejoice always. He's not saying that every task, every job, every situation is going to be fun. But joy is not about necessarily happiness or fun. It is about choosing to rejoice. You know what? Taxes are not fun. No, I, I get it. But I will rejoice because I live in a free country. And I will rejoice that I get to pay taxes because I have an income. We can look at it different ways. Find the joy in the situation. Inject some goodness into that area of life. You are setting the mood for yourself and for your family and for your church and for your community in how you approach circumstances. Not letting those circumstances control your emotions. See, that's where, that's where the world gets it all backwards. I don't feel like it today. You know, if you wait till you feel like it, you're probably never going to do it. I never feel like paying my taxes. But I can find some joy in it if I look. Anybody remember the movie Pollyanna? Okay, a couple. Pollyanna is the story about a young girl who comes to an embittered town and confronts their attitude with her determination to see the best in life. That positive, can-do attitude, right? Eventually, Pollyanna's positive attitude does affect those around her, but it's not an easy road, if you remember the story. There's a lot of conflict, there's a lot of situations, she ends up getting hurt. I'm not going to give the whole story away. But she maintains her positive attitude and people see it. And they're drawn to it. There's something about that. I recently, <laughs> I recently had a patient on the ambulance that was not happy with me. Well, she wasn't, she wasn't happy. She was, she was not happy before I got there. I'll put it that way. I, did, I didn't make her not happy. She was not happy that they called the ambulance in the first place. She was not sick, though she was. And I was trying to show her that, you know, they, listen, they're caring for you. They're wanting to make sure that, that you get the help you need. And we're just here to make sure that you're okay. And she finally looked at me. And I had to resist not to laugh. But I really wanted to laugh in the situation. I didn't think that would help. But she told me to take my Pollyanna self out of there. And I thought to myself, she means that as an insult, and yet I don't take it that way. That's what I found funny, you know? And, you know, me and my partner chuckled about it lately, uh, later, but I found that funny because she was saying that that Pollyanna attitude was just, it was, it was wrong. 
I'm thinking to myself, no, no, I don't think so. We've got to find some good. There's plenty of bad, and it pops up everywhere. And it can affect us, yes, but we can take control of that, control of our emotions, control of our, our life, and say, well, you know, that's happening, but I'm going to find some good here. Many times the world does not want us to be positive. Why is that? Why is the world so keen on being negative? I think it's because when people allow their emotions to control them, they are easier to be controlled. Ever thought about that? A person who is able to control their emotions, in contrast, is very hard to control. Think about it. If you can get someone upset, I mean really push their buttons, you can almost convince them to do anything. Okay, let's go back to the, 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 the schoolyard, right? How many times did we hear or maybe even said, I dare you. I dare you to do that. Oh no, you're, you're chicken. Right? We've heard that. What are we trying to do? We're trying to manipulate that person and do something probably stupid. Let's be honest. It probably is going to get them in trouble or us in trouble. Or It might be funny at the moment, but it's, it, we're trying to get them to do something that their better judgment is saying I shouldn't do. But if we get them upset enough and we call them chicken and we, we, we lay that on there, your yellow, yellow belly... They're eventually maybe going to cave because they're going to let the emotions take over. You know, God is in control ultimately, right? And he calls us to be in control of ourselves. The one who remains calm and logical does not give in to impulses and rash decisions. And, a one, and one that can remain calm and logical also can let their faith show through as they trust God for who, God who is really in control. And that person remains unflappable, unmovable, steadfast. So Paul makes his choice to have joy in all circumstances, to do everything without grumbling and complaining, to trust in God no matter what. And to follow obediently where God leads. You know, sometimes we've got to put those thoughts in place first and say, this is how my day is going to go. No matter what happens, I'm going to trust God. No matter what happens, I'm going to choose joy. No matter what goes on out those doors, I am going to stand firm. Paul commends the Philippians for being the same. He says, you obeyed when I was there and you're doing it even more when I wasn't. He, He's finding joy in that. He's commending them for that. But he's also calling them on to more. Even though he's not there to personally guide them every step of the way, he's saying, look, there's more out there. Okay, you've got, you've got this part mastered. Let's go on another step. You know, what is our whole education built upon? What we've learned before. You don't jump ahead and try to do, you know, the end of your education, because we learn every day, right? You don't jump ahead and say, I'm going to just jump into the deep end. No, you, you progressively go through, right? I mean, you can't do algebra until you've learned the basics of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Can you imagine, can you imagine throwing an algebra book in front of a first grader? I mean, that's how to make somebody not like math. Completely. Paul was saying that there's more, there's more to come. And as Paul looks at what they have done, he is saying his joy is multiplied. He already chose joy, but now it's getting him even more because he sees the results of this church in Philippi. It's like, have you ever had somebody come up to you and tell you your child did something nice? Your child was polite? Your child was helpful? What does that do? Oh, makes you feel good, doesn't it? 
It makes you feel good. There's a joy there. And our sacrifice, our service to others, our lives should exhibit joy. It's the legacy we get to pass on. It's a shining example, Paul says. To shine like the stars in the sky. There's an old adage that says that more is caught than taught. Meaning that children, new believers, trainees, whoever follows you, they will learn much more from your example watching you than whatever you tell them. Your words only carry so much weight. Now, every ambulance I've been a part of has had some sort of a probationary period when a new recruit works with some sort of a trainer, a preceptor. And that trainer has several roles. It's not just about the, the person that's coming up through the ranks. It's about the person that's there, how they're training them. The first thing is they're there to evaluate that new person's skills. This person has gone through a, a class. They've learned how to do it, but they've not practiced it. And so it's evaluating where they are and what they need to work on and, and how well they do their job. And not just medical skills either, but there's the, 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 the interpersonal skills too. Do they get along with their coworkers? Are they, are they polite to the people they're serving? There's proficiencies that need to be displayed. Secondly, the trainer is there to teach the company protocols and procedures. Every ambulance does things a little bit differently. We have different ways of doing Everything from timesheets to documentation to running calls to checking trucks. Everybody does it just a little different from station to station. And then, you know, getting them up to speed is, is part of a team. You know, they're, they're, they're making the whole team better. And then the third thing is the trainer is there to be a safety net of sorts. To protect the new guy until they get their feet under them. Until they know what they're doing. Until they're ready to fly solo. I've had some great trainers in life. I've had some great trainers in the ambulance. I've even gotten to train a few newbies myself. One thing I quickly noticed, though, in both those situations, but especially when I was training, is if I had a bad habit, or I had something I slacked on, or I had something that I did that wasn't quite up to snuff, the person I was training would pick that up and usually follow it. You know, we all have that default, don't we? We do the least amount possible. I mean, most of us don't wake up in the morning going, I'm going to give 300% every day. Most of us don't. Some people do, I know. I respect them. Sometimes you got to pull back a little bit from that too. But, but usually we're like... All right, what's the, what's the least amount I need to get done today, right? Okay? What do I need to do just to make sure that the kids are fed, the house doesn't blow up, and I get my job, you know, be able to continue my job? We tend to default to that. But if we want to have quality, we've got to push ourselves a little more. And if we want the people coming behind us to have that kind of quality, we've got to be better than the ones we're leading. That's where a leader stands out. We have to be better than the ones we're leading. It takes much more effort and discipline to be the proper example of how work should be done, of how Christian life should be done, of how a family should be run, of how life should be. It takes a lot more effort to do that. This Christian walk is not always easy. And when somebody comes, becomes a new believer... There's a lot of transformation that's happening. And hopefully there is a mature believer that comes alongside them and helps to guide them along the, every step of the way. But we need to be looking at ourselves because we've got to be the example for them. And they're going to pick out inconsistencies. And they might pick up some of our bad habits if we have them. Because that's the simple nature poking through. They've already figured out the bad stuff. They're trying to figure out the good stuff. That's what we've got to show them. 
We have to lovingly rebuke them at times, but we often also have to discipline ourselves to be the proper example. That shining example Paul talks about. You know, when you're in a pitch dark room, it doesn't take very much light to be noticed. Just a little pinprick of light shines brightly. And when that light shines, it becomes a beacon to others. We had the power outage, right? It's such a weird feeling going through towns and realizing all the power's out, right? It's just... There's something, though, about your eye is drawn to a light. Somebody has a generator. Or maybe the other side of town still has power. You're drawn to that light. It just, it's automatic. When we are shining the light of Christ, it draws people. And as it draws people, hopefully there's more lights that show up. The goal is to dispel the darkness. It's not done through anything hard action, really. It's that soft light shining. It's doing the things in my life that I know I should do. That's shining my light. I'm not responsible for anybody else. But I am totally responsible for myself. And this world is pretty dark at times. And we've been given that true light that will chase away the darkness if we choose to be obedient and faithful, but that also makes us a target for the enemy. That doesn't mean we shouldn't shine it. It just means that we need to understand there is a battle going on. And the more we shine, the more we're going to draw people to God, but the more we are also going to probably arouse the enemy's ire. How is the legacy you're working on? How is the attitudes and the actions that you choose every day? Where is that taking you? How is it influencing others? Are you displaying joy? Joy in Christ? Are you shining the light of Christ wherever you go? <laughs> Are you doing everything without grumbling and complaining? I know where I'm working on this next week. When you get to heaven and God says, well done, good and faithful servant, what is he going to be talking about? Do all the good you can by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as ever you can. God has called us to be that light, that constant light, shining in the darkness. But for us to shine, we have to be in the right place with God. We have to be growing with Him. We have to be learning from Him. We have to be choosing to follow Him, to rejoice day by day. As Paul says, I will rejoice. Would you stand with me? If you don't like this passage today, that's okay. I don't either. But we need to hear it, don't we? God has called us to more. We are his people. We have a special truth entrusted to us. We need to bring joy into this world. The world doesn't have enough of it. We need to bring light into this world. The world definitely doesn't have enough of it. We need to be the people of God wherever we go. So spend a couple minutes as we close here and just talk to God. Find out what he wants you to work on and then take a step this week.
Father, we want to be your people. We are so thankful for all that you've done in our lives. And it's hard sometimes because the world presses in. The darkness seems to overcome the, the situations of life. They take us down. Father, give us your joy. Give us your peace. Give us your strength to stand and shine that light in the darkness. Help us to constantly remember the example of Christ that we might follow it and be an example for others. Help us to do everything without grumbling or complaining. Help us to choose joy and obedience. Father, help us to follow you more closely. As we go through this week, help us to remember that you are right there with us. Guide us every step of the way. Give us a good week in you. We know not everything's going to be good, but we know that everything in you will be something we can rejoice over. So show us that. Give us that heavenly perspective as we go.